Good afternoon, everyone present here virtually. You're welcome, very welcome to the fourth of the Jamnabai Narsi Education Series webinars. The series is an initiative undertaken by the Narsi Monji Educational Trusts, Jamnabai Narsi Schools. At the helm of this project is trustee Mr. Sujay Jairaj with his quintessential vision to embrace change. He's purpose driven to the effect of the betterment of the society at large. We owe abundant gratitude to Mr. Sujay Jairaj for the same. Since its launch, we have been guided virtually by experts in matters to do with finance, market, economy, and spirituality. While we await some more attendees to join us today, let me tell you about what is lined up for tomorrow. Tomorrow at 2.30, uh, that is tomorrow is Thursday, the 9th of April at 2.30 p.m., success coach Mr. Anand Chulani is going to talk to us about unstoppable under uncertainty strategies to supercharge yourself. So do sign up again in large numbers for our future webinars. You're waiting for the formal introduction of our speaker for today who really needs no introduction and our moderators will get to that in just a minute. I'd like to introduce our moderators for today. Deputy Head of Jamnabai Narsi International School, Mr. Michael Gramlik, and MYP Coordinator and IB Examiner, Ms. Sonal Chabria, will moderate this afternoon's session. Without any further ado, I'd like to hand over the proceedings to them, but let me remind you attendees, please send in your questions through the Q&A tool while the talk is on so that the moderators may make note of them and present them to our speaker thereafter. Enjoy the session ahead. Thank you, Sonali. Good afternoon. Never has there been a global lockdown. Never has there been zero air traffic since the advent of the aircraft. Never has man the hunter become globally, as a community, the hunted. COVID has changed how people work, behave, and relate to each other. Schools have closed down in the past because of wars and weather, but never have we had schools to gear up technically and pedagogically in such a short period of time. Learning has gone online, challenges have gone online, leadership. It is about how effectively and how fast we react, keeping the balance, faith, and the trust of the entire community, whether it is a country, a business, corporations, or higher educational institutes. In this crisis situation, leaders lead from the front. And in this webinar, we have Dr. Shahani, whose institution was one of the first to respond to online teaching and learning. And she's someone who believes in turning challenges into opportunities. Before I hand over to Mr. Michael, I request the attendees once again to send in your questions to Dr. Shahani in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Mr. Gramley. Thank you, Ms. Sonal. Uh, it's my great honor today to welcome uh, Dr. Indu Shahani. She has been a leader in Mumbai education for many, many decades. Her roles in, have included things like being the sheriff of Mumbai, which is a huge responsibility. She is also the founding dean of the Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship. She is the chair and president of academics of the Indian School of Design and Innovation, ISDI, WPP School of Communication, and the Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship. From my chats with her colleagues, everyone tells me that she is the most hands-on and powerful leader they have ever met in their life. She embraces every single challenge, not with any type of negativity, but with a backbone and with a fire to get things done as quickly as possible. I know that she is also uh, a very passionate grandmother, everyone tells me, and mm -hmm. that her care of her students extends beyond the classroom into supporting them in their personal ventures and scholarships. Uh, her influence on many thousands of lives is quite simply amazing. Welcome, Dr. Shahani. How are you today? Thank you so much. I'm very well. Good. Uh, first of all, may I ask, how are your family doing these days? Is everyone healthy and productive? Everyone's doing well. Thank you so much. 
Wonderful. The way the session will work is we will hand the stage to you in just a moment and Dr. Shahani will do a presentation for us for perhaps 30 or 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we will collect uh, any of our, our guests' questions that will be sent in and Ms. Sonal and I will rejoin you in about 35 or 40 minutes to ask you some of our guests' questions. So without further ado, the stage is yours. Please, Dr. Shahani. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sonal. And thank you, Sonali. And of course, thank you, Sujay. Uh, I have to say that, uh, first of all, let me apologize that uh, why is the session at 2.30 in the afternoon? Because my granddaughter sleeps at the time. And that's the only time I can really have some peace around because <laughs> otherwise she wants to be a part of everything that I'm doing. Uh, so thank you so much and thank you JNS uh, schools. Uh, I have to say Sujay that uh, I would like to remember your grandfather today here, Chhatrabhuj Narsi, uh, Chhatrabhuj Bhai Narsi. He was the chair of the Narsi Munji Institutes at that time when I uh, was, uh, my teaching career really blossomed at the Narsi Munji College. And I have to say it was a lot of encouragement given by your father. So I feel absolutely indebted to him, but I also feel very indebted to the Jamnabai Nursi School in Juhu because my son started his schooling there. And as I said earlier, had I been in Juhu, there is no other school I would have sent my granddaughter to but your schools. So you're doing a wonderful job, Sujay. Carry on. You've got amazing set of teachers and amazing kids. And the only way I can talk about the kids is because I have had the privilege of all of you, your children, over the years at HR College and now at ISMI and ISD and at my new institutions. Thank you. You're doing something so correct. I think all of us should really get to know what the DNA is all about. Sujay, I would suggest you should do one session yourself to say the DNA of Jamnabai Nursi schools, and that would be very interesting. Um, I just wanted to say that today, uh, what I'm going to do is I've been doing this session with my uh, students, and I've, I've been doing this session with the parents. Um, basically, we just like trying to observe and see what's leadership in a crisis. Michael said I was, uh, you know, I, I've been a, a, a sheriff and I have to say that the only way that a sheriff would have worked at this time would have been if it had been a gun-toting sheriff because then I would, would have had to really frighten everyone to stay at home. But I think leadership, in a crisis is different at different times. Uh, uh, my talk is going to be very simple. Um, initially, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> global leaders, how have they reacted to this crisis. Then I'm going to go and talk about businesses and corporate leaders, how have they reacted to, reacted to this crisis, and finally come down to uh, the educational institutions, schools and colleges, how are they reacting, what is the future ahead? So to begin with, let's look at first have a historical perspective. As you all know that uh, there have been epidemics, but this one has been announced as a pandemic. I, I've done some research and I've seen that Spanish flu was in 1980, 1999, Asian flu in 1957, 58, Hong Kong flu in 1968, and the SARS was, of course, very recent in 2002 and 4. Uh, one of the things that I want to bring to your notice about these epidemics is that India has an Epidemic Disease Act, which was actually formulated under the British because we probably had the bubonic plague at that time, and it's in 1897. This gives very limited powers to the center. Uh, and has not been changed since 1897 in the 123 years. So what happens is health is a state subject. Center's role is only advisory 
and therefore it has to be a collective decision every time the center wants to take a decision. This is very peculiar to India, just keep that in mind. Let's go next. I just wanted to show you the Spanish flu, the notice that was given in 1918, right? As you can see, is the same notice that was given in 2020. We call ourselves the 21st century, but the same notice went on when you get a crisis, a crisis does not see what century you are in. And you can see they've got face masks and they probably did everything what we are doing. Um, let's look at the next slide and see uh, how have the countries actually helped to flatten the curve. Uh, different countries have reacted differently. China, of course, it started all with that, but China somehow has been able to come out of it and is on the way to recovery. But I think if you could, I know it's a crowded slide and I know it is going to be a little difficult for you to uh, see the different uh, colors, but just look at the blue color and the blue color shows that South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, they flatten the curve faster than the other countries have. We all know Italy, Spain, really got the brunt of it. So let's go and see how have they, how have the world leaders, global leaders actually uh, looked at this entire thing and how have they responded to this crisis? Okay, here we go. Uh, as you know, Europe closed down its external borders on 17th of March. Uh, the UK prime minister brought in strict measures on 23rd of March, probably a little later than it should have come earlier. And then too, it was a partial lockdown. And it's very unfortunate that the prime minister himself has had, is in the intensive care. And yesterday we've got news that he's not doing too well. Uh, this is really unfortunate. And as I saw a headline today saying that Britain is collapsing under a prime minister who's not able to be able to govern. I think a lot of people will come into now and help out, but this is really sad. Let's look at, while we talk about this, how is USA fighting it? USA, I think the US has had the highest number of cases in the world as of 29th March. And it's announced a stay at home. It's been, I would say, sometimes very relaxed. Sometimes they started some states started becoming very, very uh, strict about what they were doing. Uh, Trump initially announced that we might even reopen on Easter. But as you can see now, because of the highest number of cases and the fastest growth in the US, they are now taking stringent uh, measures. But uh, sometimes when you hear the president, you hear him for yourself, Look at the priorities. They're going to be coming out with the uh the regulations on that and if people want to abide by them frankly i don't think you could i don't think they'll be mandatory because some people don't want to do that but uh if people want it as an example on the masks if people wanted to wear them they can if people wanted to use scarves which they have many people have them they can in many cases the scarf is better it's thicker i mean you can if you depending on the material it's thicker A recommendations coming out we'll see what that recommendation is but but i will say this they can pretty much decide for themselves right now um so before we go to the islands prime minister let me just tell you that uh, u.s obviously has as you can see the priorities which are so different there is no proof of the scarves being any better than masks. 
and if the president himself gives a, a lecture where it says, and this is, I think the point I want to make here is democracies. As he says, oh, if they want to wear masks, they can wear, if they don't want to wear masks, they do not wear. Does it mean that in a democracy, you do not bring in rules? China did work faster because their context was different. India, let's take a question mark and see, can we succeed in a democracy? And I think that's something that we'll wait to watch. Ireland's Prime Minister returns to medical practice to help in the coronavirus crisis. He's been a doctor, he practiced for seven years, and he now is working one day a week as a doctor and actually governing the rest of, uh, governing the country from the rest of the six days. This is a great example that probably a lot of us did not know about. Next, uh, I think Singapore, as we saw, had flattened quite quickly. They actually went in uh, very early into testing. They went very early as it, it's known as an antiseptic uh, uh, nation and they did things very quickly. However, they now have gone back to the lockdown and this is, this is something that only Singapore would be able to do because they are so careful of every step they take. And I think the leadership of the prime minister is something that you should all look at, keep seeing his videos. It's very interesting how clear he is, how specifically he speaks about every point. And it's not about scarves and masks, it's about actually what will help people in medicines, in, in talking about testing, talking about care, talking about hospitals, everything that is needed. Now look at, let's look at what India did. I think we're all proud today because our prime minister acted very quickly. It is not easy. India is a democracy. 1.3 billion people for a lockdown is a nightmare. It's something that we could have never, never imagined. But it happened. It's, we did have our problems. I think we had not been, we were not ready as yet for the supply chain, for the essentials. We had not probably been aware of the problem that would come up with the immigrants. We were not aware of certain religious activities that were still going on. But having said that, I think uh, I must compliment our government. They are not only keeping our health issues in the forefront, but are keeping our morale high. Uh, we have seen on occasions that the country has come together and it just goes to show that we are bringing entire India together, which is not easy. Very often I've heard a statement which says, Indians do well anywhere they go, but India doesn't because we don't stand united. Today, I'm proud of my country that it stands united and we look forward to um, 14th of April to see the next set of uh, regulations that would come in. And I must admit uh, that all the people are very, very cooperative. Um, Let's look at the next thing. Uh, we, we must get some lessons from China for all these global leaders to see what are the leadership lessons here we must learn. One of the first things is the speed and accuracy. I think that's very important. Uh, they had to, in, under these circumstances, speed was of essence. It was important to see how your healthcare support was what were your medical resources available to you? Quickly gauge that because it was an illness. It was a war not against each other. It was a war against a virus. And I think medical help was the most important. A complete lockdown. I'm sure it must have been very difficult for many countries to do it. But I'm sure I think China led the way in this. And I think one of the other reasons, one of the other areas where China actually led the way is big, big data and information. Uh, 
The government has also come out with many, Indian government has also come out with many um, apps which tell you how close you are to getting uh, infected or, or how susceptible you are. And I think using technology, but China used this technology very quickly. So four quick lessons that we can see from the global leaders. And we wish them all the best and we hope the global leaders keep giving them more, more lessons and keep leading the world because I think it's the global leaders who really matter today. But I think after this, we must see what's happening in the VUCA world. We all know that VUCA stands for V for volatility, U for uncertainty, C for complexity, and A for ambiguity. A lot of the corporates talk about the VUCA world, but I felt this was something that we must now change and make VUCA under the circumstances where we've got such a tremendous crisis. I think we should create V for leadership and vision. We should keep U for unity, C for compassion, and A for agility. These are the four new terms for VUCA. We must have a clear vision. And I think I must compliment Sujay Bhai because to have webinars, to continue teaching to the students, seeing what the future is, it's a great vision for an educator. To get all your teachers on board, your students on board, and and your parents on board. Thank you, parents, for being there today. Uh, I'm aware that we have about 153 uh, participants right on. I did go through the lists a little earlier, and I saw many more mothers were there, and I would welcome you all. Sorry that you had to go off for your afternoon sleep, but thank you for being with us, because it was very important for uh, us to meet together. I think compassion, the more we talk about it, the better it is. Uh, I have seen a number of steps that corporates are putting into place for, for ensuring that there's complete empathy for your workers, for your partners, for your uh, entire stakeholders, and of course, agility. How quickly can you adapt? It's amazing. I felt that we always did uh, online teaching because it doesn't feel as if I just got onto it two or three weeks earlier. It's absolutely ama amazing to see the agility and Indians for technology, the agility is even smarter and better. Okay, let's go so to see what the corporates must do in a, in a crisis. One of the first things is very difficult to define a crisis and to recognize that, yes, it's a crisis. Very often, and I'm sure Sujay Bhai, I've often uh, talked to your principals, uh, Zenath, when there is a bund or when there is uh, some, you know, traffic problems or there is, uh, you know, crisis with rains and so on. And I ask her, what are you doing about closing your school and so on. And she's given very clear instructions to me and a, a clear, a shared very clear, uh, you know, uh, way out of what they are doing. And I must compliment you because recognizing a crisis and taking immediate steps is something that I really feel is amazing. Uh, one of the important things here to remember is that you do not have to give a predefined response. What worked in the floods may not work here. What worked in a band may not work here. This is a different crisis. So gauge the seriousness. How do you gauge the seriousness? It's absolutely unexpected. Did we know this word COVID at all? I mean, my three-year-old girl, my granddaughter sings the song, go Corona, go, go Corona, go. Did we ever have that as a nursery rhyme? Overwhelming speed with which it's moving. And of course, the fear it brings to its stakeholders and employers. As leaders, I think one of the first things for all of us is to see that we check the behaviors, 
we plan for the mindsets, and we look ahead. And I think that's the exercise we are going to do towards the end of this session to see how are we going to handle our education if this goes on and on, and what else are we going to do? So let's very quickly look at Con Ferry, who says one of the first things you should do when there is such a tremendous crisis is explicit but very transparent communication. Keep the businesses running effectively. And of course, one word that has become absolutely a word that everyone is talking about is work from home, VFH. And, and I think it's amazing that sometimes I have to tell people around it's work from home and also work at home because we need to work to get the food on the table. So, so out of office, but keep going, the work going, engage, 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 leading through and beyond the virus. You have flexible timings, you can work differently. And how do you really go and go beyond this? I have on a lighter note, if you would permit me, I just thought I saw one video which was so sweet uh, for people working out of office, and I felt I might share this with you. Scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> what is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year. Because I think what's very good here is that, um, you know, he continued, he tried to continue. But it's amazing when you're talking about North Korea and South Korea, this definitely was a lighter moment. So let's get back to leadership principles and say these would be the seven principles. Uh, I put all these down together because I felt as I was looking at observing how corporates were, were reacting and responding to this crisis and global leaders were responding and the communities were responding, I felt these seven were most important. I think you have to keep a calm, but this calm has to be a decided calm so that you are aware of why and what decisions you're taking. Confidence, but confidence within, with reality Communication, I think at all times. Cash, I think, of course, is what's going to hit the world the most. I'm not talk going to be talking here about the economic fall fallout of uh, uh, the crisis, but I think that's going to be a major hit. And I do hope we can get back to our, uh, uh, we, our economies can get back to their original or even do better after is this a recession a depression what is this crisis i think we're going to figure out a little later community yes i think this is what i i've never seen uh, you know people around me in my housing uh, building come together so much to help each other out and and um, you know we are all the time and connected helping out people who are not so privileged. And I think that's the compassion shown is amazing and the collaborations shown is amazing. So don't forget that the seven C's are very important for any leadership style. Let's now look at what world leaders, corporate leaders did. Let's look at Tim Cook, Apple CEO. Yes, he did close down all his retail stores. Uh, he brought in early workers and gave them the same pay. No pay cuts were given there. Uh, he looked ahead. Uh, there was uh, a, a, an Apple statement made very quickly on March 13. And actually, uh, WHO had announced this as a pandemic only on 11th March. And he went ahead and look at the contribution, 15 million contribution. Next, let's look at the next. Of course, down home here, back home here, 
Tata Chairman, Mr. Ratan Tata came right in the, giving all the, the other corporates and industrialists a lead, 500 crores for the coronavirus pandemic. Let's see next. Uh, we had pharma companies who were battling against uh, coronavirus. There is now a coalition of all the global companies, Novartis, Merck, G GSK, Sanofi, Eli Lili, um, Pfizer, all have come together with Bill and Melinda Gates, first to get more and more doses of medicines, then to get uh, a lead vaccine, and to then get billion dollars of uh, development for the vaccine. That would really save to 2021. Let's go next. Uh, this is Mr. Anand Mahendra. This was a picture taken with our students. And I thought that I must talk about all those leaders who have visited my school and how they are reacting to this. Uh, Mr. Mahendra has actually converted his factories into making ventilators and, of course, given his away his salary. The next, we had Colgate chief with us, Ram Raghavan, and he one of the aspects that I also sit on the board of Colgate, Colgate, so he shared one of the things with us was that the government is allowing the uh, you know, groceries as a part of the essential list, but there is very limited labor available at the warehouses for even transportation. So supply chain has broken down. I think this will be a major consideration for the government if they are continuing the lockdown after uh, April 14. Let's look at the next one is Diageo, which is an alcohol company. Again, I sit on the board of this company. These are all the board members who had visited our institution. And I have to say, we had a discussion and what can a liquor company do at this time to bring in the compassion? The best thing a liquor company could do was to bring in 8 million bottles of hand sanitizer and donate alcohol. Let's go next. Um, we had Sanjeev Mehta also on our institution as the keynote speaker for our graduation. And I have been speaking and finding out more about what they are doing. Besides giving money, they took out, they've reduced the prices of their soaps and sanitizers and the cleaning uh, detergents. Let's look at next. Coca-Cola, of course, as you know, has uh, closed down its operations. We really appreciate that because it's not an essential and they have acknowledged that at this stage, they should step out of production. Let's go. Um, let's go next. Yes, Reliance. Uh, two important things you must see here besides the 500 crores that Reliance has individually also given five crores to the state of Maharashtra and Gujarat. And I think one very important part that you should see here is that first 100 bed uh, exclusive COVID-19 hospital is coming up within two weeks. I think we will need more and more of these hospitals as we go along. Let's go next. Um, Maruti Suzuki is uh, producing ventilators. Let's go next. IBM, which is actually doing a big service of cybersecurity for people who are doing work for home. The entire world is working from home. So we need cybersecurity. Ola, as we know, in India has uh, supported drivers. Here, I would just like to say one more thing. Every industry is supporting their own drivers, uh, uh, supporting their own uh, workers. We know that even the film industry has come out to say that they are supporting their uh, uh, workers. The one industry that's doing very well is, of course, the t television, because the total consumption keeps jumping. And if you were to believe uh, Arnav Goswami, he does say that it has gone up dramatically. It's not just 8%, but he's, it's going up dramatically. While I'm talking about the television, there was one, I think, companies have to now create advertisements, which this is again leadership, because don't give out, give out your original ads which were existing. You have to now quickly create advertisements that actually have compassion. They 
reflect what's happening in, in the country, in the families. And I thought the next ad of Asian Pains was something that I wanted to share with you. Har har chup chap se kehta hai ki aajkal andar jada kaun rehta hai? Diwaron par lagi tasviron ko kaun sila karta hai? Kaun barso baad farsh par saat baith kar khana khata hai? Char kadmo mein school kaun jata hai? Kaun ghar baithe office ke sare kaam niptata hai? Aur aajkal phool patton se gappe bhi ladata hai? Kaun balcony mein gym banata hai? ऑफिस का एक मैनेजर किचन में ट्रेनी बन जाता है बच्चों को अपने बचपन की नटकट कहानियां सुनाता है एशियन पेंट्स हर घर चुपचाप से ये कहता है कि जब सब घर में हों तो घर खिल खिलाता रहता है स्टे होम स्टे सेफ I thought that was very touching, and I think all of us are are going through this. I keep talking to my students, keep asking them uh, the bonding that's going on in the families, and it's amazing to see a lot of people doing different things. Uh, we as a family meet every day at 7 p.m. in the evening to do play to play a family game because we feel. that all of us have actually become busier than before and we are on our computers and 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 either the housework and i think it's important for the family bonding uh i i thought i'll quickly take you through how effectively brands are responding to social distancing we'll go very quickly let's go mcdonalds for the first time in 64 years history it alters its logo and makes the two arches uh, separate Let's look at the next one, Mastercard. We see them getting separated. Let's look next. You have the HDFC logo, which is the original, but it's saying maintaining social distance yet being near you 24 into 7. Amazing. Uh, LinkedIn is locked in. Let's look next. Just do it. Is just don't do it. and of course tabaks is completely closed it's shut its stores and audi the four rings have separated let's go next and of course olympics these uh, are our nations have separated for the moment but all the sports people will come together hopefully uh, the rings will come together july 2021 and coca cola i like this when they said today being apart is the best way of being together and the my favorite all time favorite is fevicol which says kal ke mazboot jod ke liye aaj thodi duri maintain corona and we at our school have also changed our logo for the time being and we have gone into social distancing as you can see isdi are separated and now you can see isme is also separated because now we are learning across boundaries let's go and see what's happening on the education see and that's my final 5 minutes uh, of the talk which says given the mission and function of schools uh, and given the um, you know that the universities and schools need to examine everything that they do uh, so first of all let me let me compliment the ugc the university grants uh, commission which has made it mandatory for all universities across india to give a day salary to pms relief fund uh, we we really compliment and we thank all the teachers uh, the most important thing that's happened education goes online and i would to begin with like to compliment uh, jns because here's something that i have got an actual live picture of two little girls who go to jamna bai nursery school juhu and they are 7 years old in the second standard and this is how they are already onto a a pre 
define, determine, program, and look at them. I don't think they must be paying so much attention, even in class, but wonderful. So did we at ISD and ISME. Um, it's been three weeks of online learning. We've had 900 plus sessions. We've had 500 plus student hours clocked in, 100 plus breakout rooms, 99% attendance. No undergraduate colleges would have had this kind of attendance were it face to face. Online mentoring sessions going on, faculty meetings going on, lecture recordings going on. It's been an amazing experience. Let's go next. So how are universities and K-12 schools responding to coronavirus? Classes go online. There are faculty orientations for virtual classrooms. I think this is something very important. Uh, I'm sure all your schools are doing this. We have a regular a once a week meeting where we talk about best practices that the teachers followed in their classes and they share those with the others to say this worked better, this may work, you know, let, let's try it on and they share their best practices. So because we, we were not always trained in virtual classrooms, I think it's important that faculty orientations carry on. Communication on social distancing, that is something that every school and college must continue doing to all their, their uh, students, their families, and keep asking about their welfare. Uh, webinars for parents, and I compliment Sujay and, and JNS schools for doing this. Uh, it's also faculty development. Uh, and of course, most important will be, as you said, workshops are now going on and more and more technology will come up for integration of practice and theory. Let's go next. Uh, I just picked up this one slide, which frightened me a lot. And I thought I'd share this with you because it's come just yesterday. And it's a McKinsey and Company slide. It's April 2020. How should US universities and education plan for an uncertain future? As you know, the United States has the largest number of international students and faculty. Schools, this is what the worst case scenario, McKinsey says, this will be the worst case scenario. I'm not saying this will be the scenario, please don't uh, misunderstand, but this I can always send you and you can Google and find this uh, on, uh, on, online. And it says schools will be exclusively online throughout 2020. Travel will be greatly limited. Study abroad programs will be canceled through 2021. No on-campus orientations. As you know, lots of parents used to take their students and go and see the campuses before they went there. Faculty will have to make changes to their curriculum and teaching approaches. This, let me repeat again, is a worst case scenario. But all those who are thinking of studying abroad, a lot of this will be, India will come to normalcy faster then Indian higher education system will come to normalcy faster than the US higher education system. That's my guess. But I think we have to wait and watch and we have to see. There are lots of decisions many, many parents will have to take about students going abroad to study. Uh, and that gives an opportunity for Indian institutions to actually uh, step up the game and go digital. So how does, uh, there's one very interesting uh, survey that I found, and I thought I must share this with it, with you, that is the digital world everything that, that, that the students want? Let's find out what the students want. 97% of the students use internet to find answers for educational purposes. It's sad that, that the libraries have all become digital libraries and the books are not in hand, but it's not sad in that sense. Students are reading much more because they are fast 
character while they are on the internet. But this is an amazing, I think most of us knew it. 85% of the students, now this is something that parents must note and educators must note. 85%, and this is a BOE research, so please look it up if you want to. 85% of the students prefer blended learning. So at any stage, even now, we are having mentoring sessions where five or six students at a time are taking office hours from our teachers and asking them difficulties and asking them questions. Some of them do office hours even on the phone. So blended learning is really the future. Let's look next. Now, this is the most interesting one. 90% of the students still, still, still attribute their success to their school teachers. So hats off to you teachers and on campus life. They definitely miss the social interaction with their, their friends, their students. They miss those playgrounds. They miss being in class. They miss everything. So 90% of students will miss it. We do hope we will come back to normalcy very quickly. As I told you, the Indian higher education system will adapt easily to blended learning. I feel gradually it might be uh, blended learning, it might be online, then it will be blended, and then we might go back to some of our regular teaching. Let's look at the next slide. And how do we get ready for a future? Crafting a future. Teaching will have to become coaching. Let's go next. Tech aided will have to be tech enabled. Takeaway three will be educators will have to become edupreneurs. And I think all of us have today become edupreneurs because we are doing so many different things just to meet the needs of the students. And, and I would like to just say finally that uh, uh, India led people in the spiritual purpose. But here's Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft, who says that I'm a strong believer that there is a spiritual purpose behind everything that happens. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that the whole world is recognizing and introspecting and seeing that it's time to stop because we were on a roller coaster, as you can see. Um, next as you can see, we were all on a roller coaster, just going crazy with, with our work, with our time, with our social life, with everything. Now everything's come to a standstill. The 21 days has given us an opportunity for personal growth. And I think each one of us has realized this. For students especially, I would say parents, here is a time, there's a theory which says, it takes 21 days to form a new habit. I'm sure by the end of 21 days, uh, your students would have had, uh, young people would have formed new habits, new skills, great family bonding. Even after the lockdown, please carry on the family bonding. I don't think so. I ever had lunch and dinner, two meals a day, entirely with the entire family for many, many years. And it's such a pleasure. And of course, new knowledge is coming up. And in new knowledge, let me tell you, now is the time to watch out for all the case studies because what this corona virus has done to the world is creating new knowledge. And I'm already on, I'll be going on to a Harvard uh, webinar very soon to say what new case studies are being brought in so that they are able to talk about how are they handling leadership, how are they handling financial crisis, how are they handling supply chain, customer behavior, all this. And so we look forward to the new knowledge. But I would just like to end with saying that after the crisis, the world will never be the same, but maybe it can be better let us all pledge that we will make the world a better place.
Thank you so much. That was wonderful, uh, uh, Dr. Shani. And I liked your little interceptions of the little videos. I love the little kids coming in and you've actually shown us what a wonderful grandmother you are. I think you must have mentioned your babies and family. Um, you did speak about the Indian government. You said that um, basically the Indian government has reacted swiftly. It has led from the front in terms of a crisis, whether it was taking the lead to call the South Nation Conference on COVID-19 or creating an emergency fund or even the G20 summit, those the only democracy in the country love that. Do you see higher education institutes doing the same in the field of education? Do you see higher education institutes coming together to create some teaching learning plans, strategies so that education per se does not get hampered? Um, a very good point. I think higher education will come together because I think that's the need of the hour, right? We've come together, right? I'm, I'm from a university and you're here from schools and we've come together. But I think the point I want to make here is going even ahead. Higher education institutions will definitely come. But what's going to happen is higher education is now going to go in collaboration with high tech companies. And this is where high tech companies will come forward to offer many, many solutions for higher education. And that will be the real blend to look for. Yeah. Excellent. Mr. Michael, would you like to take the next one? Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shani, for uh, your, your uh, lecture. Your talk goes through so many things that are so broad yet so interpersonal. And I can see why everyone considers you such an engaging speaker because you, you seem to coalesce the whole world into your own heart. And uh, it's lovely to hear you speak. Thank you very much. Uh, one of our viewers has asked, how do you evaluate whether the online teaching that's going on is, is as actual, useful, and productive as being in the classroom? Do you think we'll have a measurement of that? I think one of the first apparent measurements is we've started doing quizzes while we are doing the online teaching. And uh, it's a Tesmos. Uh, which we use quite often just to qu quickly check is the student learning. I think what's more important is, is the student really learning? And mm -hmm. we've, we've started doing evaluations. Uh, we've started giving a lot of pre-reads, asking the students to give us questions before the pre-reads come in. Uh, for you as, as a school, I think you'll have to involve your parents to see that the students are learning or not. Your questions, your quizzes should actually go to your parents. And I'm sure all the parents are so dedicated to their children that they will ensure that the learning is taking place. You will have to now depend a lot more on all the stakeholders. You'll have to depend on your parents. You'll have to depend on your siblings. You'll have to de depend on a large number of other ed tech, uh, you know, appliances that would come in so that learning is taking place or not. But according to me, I think we are still going to, we, I still don't have a measure of how we are going to measure that. I still don't have a measure. But from the student feedback comes, that comes to us, we are trying to understand, have they understood what we were trying to tell them? And We've got older children, older, uh, older students, so their feedback actually reflects the percentage of learning that's taking place. I think if I could just follow on with a little question of my own from there, do you think that this is going to have a long-term effect on the way that we engage our students? Are the lessons that we learn in 2020 actually going to be in place in 2022 when hopefully everything is normal again? Um, I don't know about the others, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I am moving 30% of my classes online in 2021 because I feel that it was very effective. Very often, I've now been able to use a lot of international faculty who otherwise were not able to travel. Uh, while we speak, I have two sessions going on for my students 
one of my faculty members is from Russia. One of the other faculty members is from Ecuador. Do you oh. think I would have ever been able to find these uh, teachers? I think we should now make the most, take the best out of what we've learned. And, uh, you know, if we can go online, why not? Not all of it. As I told you, 90% of the students still feel that face-to-face -face is very important. But in colleges, I'm sorry, but they just don't come to college. So it's best that they do it from home. Thank you, Ms. Sono. Yes, so you know, we were just talking about testing and you do these little online quizzes, but this is um, a very short time frame that we've had. It's two weeks and three weeks of teaching where everything is new and everyone is highly attentive. Uh, the new norm is school shirt and pajamas, uh, having said that, uh, you know. Okay, may I just interrupt you for a minute? We have definitely kept a, 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 dec a protocol for students. If there are students in pajamas, we, we remove them from the, on, from the, it's very important. They have to be in semi-formals. They must have light on their face. Their videos must be on. And if there is any disturbance, we are able to find out the disturbance and check on that. And, and the person is not on, doesn't come on. So he doesn't attend. Well, so has so I think, yeah, new, new and different kinds of, uh, uh, and, you know, they can't use any kind of backdrops. We're very, very clear about that. So what I was talking about was a formal shirt and pajamas at the bottom because you can't see. Having said that, come back to testing. So the regular testing and board exams have not been implemented in 2020. No. The world is going to accept the predicted grades. How do you think this is going to affect the quality of the batch of 2020? I think it should not be a problem because all schools are very, very diligent about the way they do the, their predicted grades. For years in HR college, I used to admit all students based on their predicted grades. And I was never let down because you have to understand uh, we've had difficulties in, in admissions because what happens if your predicted grades are lower than what uh, your actual grades are lower than what your predicted grades were, you, uh, does the college ask you to leave? And those used to be the questions, but I did not have even a problem then. And I don't think I'll, we would face as universities face because we we've got SOPs we've got our own tests we've got a lot of it that we're doing ourselves so my my main thing was you know how it is the last month of grind that students go into when it is their board exam and it actually builds a part of their character yes uh, it does the grind that that belief that yes I can study for 10 hours a day or 12 hours a day or four hours a day so that's what I was wondering. That would be one portion that could be missing from the student's life. But also, what about the part of the world which is not technologically adept? We don't have electricity. I'm actually quite worried about how that learning is going to, do, uh, going to be and how we're going to be able to integrate those children into the mainstream. Because if you notice in the IITs, etc., it is, you know, people, children who are coming in from hard-pressed backgrounds who are really, really working hard, who don't have the luxuries that the urban children do. So I'm actually a little worried about how it's going to affect them. Do you have any thought on that? So I, I must say that, you know, we've been all thinking about it because all our students have uh, access to good computers, they have internet, and so we've been able to switch onto online learning very quickly, but I keep thinking about all those students. And we recently had six entrepreneurs who came on board for a discussion. And I think one of the things that's going to happen now, and that's the new businesses that you will see, or, or new, uh, I would say, um, charitable organizations will come up more and more with by in seeing that more of these students are included um, a lot of csr funding that will come up will go in for these students to see you know there'll be companies who will try and see all their factory workers children are able to uh, have access to technology I can tell you there's going to be a great change about that. And there will be inclusiveness. I think the inclusiveness today will not just be financial inclusiveness, it will be technological inclusiveness. Yes, truly. 
One of our parents has uh, sent in a couple of questions, Mr. Nishit Cheda. He's been asking uh, about the nature of the government response and the lockdown. Uh, he's asking, do you think that the, the government's programs as far as announcing and implementing the lockdown have been effective? And he follows up with another question talking about how religious gatherings are sometimes uh, something that is an absolute must for all of us. People in religious gatherings are not allowed to gather anymore. However, people who are trying to travel to their home places, we've seen these heartbreaking pictures from Delhi of the thousands of people who are gathered in a place. Do you think that the, the, the government response as far as the leniency for certain people and the uh, detention of others, do you think that it's been appropriate? I think all I'm going to say is that, first of all, I'm sitting at home and I'm only watching the news, right? Or uh, reading the, what, whatever comes on, you know, we are getting now e-papers and we're watching the news on the television. And uh, one doesn't really know what the reality on, on the street is. Very few of us really know yes, the reality. I agree. We don't, we don't know the reality. And considering we don't know the reality, I would not be the right person to comment on what the government has done right or what the government has not, not done correct. But I would say, this is why I put in the VUCA to say that it's a VUCA world. And how could the government have imagined that suddenly the immigrant workers will start getting onto the roads and start wanting to go back to their families. Yes, they could have probably anticipated it, but the time was so short and we have 1.3 billion people. Yes. I mean, look at the complexity, look yes. at the uncertainty, look at this under the circumstances. I think each one of us can contribute by doing our best and we do hope. And you know, religion is something that nobody likes to comment on because it's so personal. Yes. But I think at this time, whether it's religious group, groups or it is anyone gathering together and not being able to keep the social uh, distancing, it's unfortunate. I, or that's Thank all I can say. Can I just again follow up? I'm sorry, I'm being rude, Ms. Sono. One, one question uh, that you've already answered about your own practices for uh, uh, admitting students to the school on their, um, their grades without the examinations. How do you think this is going to affect the international university uh, industry in the next year. We have an anonymous attendee who's asked, what about the admissions around the globe? How will they be affected? So uh, I really, uh, I'm sure they're, they'll be very good with their admissions because they would have their admissions online. Anyway, for years, I've seen my students going online for interviews and so on. That I think the admissions interviews will not be affected. But I don't know if students are prepared to pay those. You know, I, I had this morning, I had a young student who called me up and said, um, he was looking at Indian universities and I said, fantastic, young man, you were the one who said that you wanted to fly off the minute you finished your IB or you finished your, uh, you know, your schooling, K-12. And he said, but, you know, I'm just quoting this young man. He said, why the hell should I pay $25,000 for be going online or why the hell should I pay whatever yeah. amount were his fees for going yes. online and for online teaching. So I really don't know how the, it, it will all depend upon. I can't really determine the student pattern at this time uh, or the university pattern, but I can tell you that so many universities, including Stanford is writing to me already to say, that if you have some interesting students, we are very happy to give scholarships and we're look, happy to look at them and so on, which means universities all over the world will face similar problems. And as far as the universities are here in, in India, uh, examinations have been postponed. Uh, this morning, I know only about Maharashtra that this morning there has been a meeting with the chancellor the vice chancellors of all 
the Maharashtra universities have met with the chancellor and I think they have planned that they will not take a decision on examinations till May 15. So if there are any examinations, it will be after May 15. And, if the, and once the examinations, because they have got about 900 and Bombay University has got about 982 examinations to be done. And uh, it's got over 800,000 students. So, you, you know, it's not going to be easy and not finish quickly. So admissions for next classes might be delayed. We don't know. We will know. Uh, uh, we'll have a clearer picture as we go along. Uh, but some of us have been fortunate that our students had already graduated from our first year into second year, second year into third year. We have already started our semesters. So that when it's gone off, uh, we can then give them a real holiday. Yeah. Thank you. That's very useful information for our viewers today. Ms. Onal? Yeah, so these are tough times and times of the global crisis where leadership is in short supply and education actually needs steady hands. You know, the future actually depends on how we handle it today. So what, uh, and one of the parents also asked, Samira Subara, uh, what are the long-term setbacks we will face in education due to this coronavirus and how do you think we can overcome them? Because we are definitely are. I mean, it, it is not as uh, hunky-dory as we would like it to be. There are a certain amount of setbacks we are going to face. So through your experience, could you think of a couple? That so I did, I did talk about the setbacks that... Uh, you know, we would face some of those challenges. I talked about it in my own uh, uh, talk. But, you know, I have a lot of faith. If you're talking about Indian students, I have a lot of faith in my Indian students. And my, of course, my Indian families too. But my Indian students, I have a lot of faith. And I'm sure our students will find amazing ways of overcoming this. And of course, we are all there to help them. Yes, truly. Uh, thank you so much, moderators. I know there are many more questions that keep pouring in. And uh, Dr. Shani, you've been so patient in answering the ones that have popped up already. Uh, but for owing to paucity of time, uh, we'll have to end this uh, Q&A here. Uh, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank, uh, to begin with, the management at Narsi Munji Educational Trust once again for this wonderful opportunity, which had been initiated for the parent community, but with the messages that keep pouring in, we realize now that the reach has been much more than what we had expected. So we are very, very happy to be able to touch people's lives. We are very happy, we are very grateful to Dr. Shani for joining us in this endeavor. Um, I'd like to mention here, I'd like to quote here, uh, comment made by one of our parents through the Q&A. Thank you for your lucid presentation. Yes. You, set the, you <laughs> set the bar high. Our world really is going to be all about, you know. Uh, so the examples right here in front of us, um, Michael, Sonal and I are very proud to belong to an institution, the motto for which is knowledge is strength supreme. So for everyone involved, our eminent speaker, our lovely moderators, our enthusiastic participants and attendees today, thank you for your involvement here this afternoon. And we look forward to sharing webinars in the future. Have a lovely day ahead, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms.